and a lot of them to redeem the Bible. I hope that as we just sing, How Great Thou Art, um, that you are picturing you know, some of these things in nature, this splendor of the woods and the noises and all of those things. And even on your way in this morning, you know, we were blessed with a sunrise, with beautiful colors, blue skies. I hear birds in the morning. I hear their sounds. You know, I have green grass that grows, that comes, you know, even in Florida in the middle of summer, you know, it's still there. And it's still green, that things come and things go. And in this demonstration, it's reflected in Psalms 104. How countless are your works, Lord. In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. All of them wait for you to give them their food at the right time. When you give it to them, they gather it. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your breath, they are created. You renew the face of the earth. We are witness to God, not just the creator, but the orchestrator. He has a precision, a plan to carry out. And we get witness to that in nature all around us. So I want us to consider for a moment then, what does that mean for the plans of my life? Specifically, what does that mean for pain in my life? If he takes such purpose and precision for nature, how precise and perfect for our good do you think it is for us? The one he sent, his one and only perfect son, to die for us that we just talked about and reflected on. How much more perfect do you think his plan is for us? even in the time of pain. So I want us to reflect on that today as we sing through our worship songs. Big lesson, but first a little commercial for all people who work at a stove in your homes. I really would recommend that you have one of these by your stove. This is a fire extinguisher. This is the way they used to be. Big, bulky, heavy, hard to manage, hard to use. You can pick up one of these things really cheap. They're just like an aerosol can. That's all they are. Just one button and it works. So anytime you have an electrical fire, gas fire around your stove and you've got kids in the house, this will put it out in just a second. And they're cheap. And uh, I have one in each one of my cars. Uh, older cars sometimes are prone to catching fire. So this is, uh, I was checking it this weekend and realized I had two in one car. So. Somehow I moved one to a car that, that uh, already had one. So I recommend this, various brands and so forth. But I'm, I have this here this morning for another reason. Yeah, so this is a lag bolt. There's various sizes. And you use a socket on this end to penetrate a piece of wood. And they're very effective to hang things on. Uh, but if I wanted to bend this with my own two bare hands, even though I am quite strong, there's no way I can bend this. I could make a fool of myself up here and grunt and groan, and I just never would do it. And no one else here could either. Yeah, if you think you could, um, you're lying. So, <laughs> but the way to get this to bend because this is made of hard coarse steel. The way to get this to bend, and I used to do this down at the prison uh, all the time before the young men in the juvenile detention center, because they were suffering the fires of pain in prison, being separated from their families. I would bring uh, some sort of a fire, some sort of a torch. And so, you know, this is a lighter, I'll let you know that. So I turn on the gas. Anytime now, you can light. All right. 
So in other words, if I take this and heat it up in the middle, and this uh, begins to reach a thousand degrees, if I just hold it here, I'm going to burn my hand off too because the heat travels through the screw. But if I hold this long enough, and it's in the fire long enough, pay attention, if it's in the fire long enough, what happens? Do you think I would just leave this on all morning? Yeah. Eventually, this will turn red hot, and I can bend it. One of the words that we're going to encounter in the Hebrew Bible this morning is related to this. I won't steal any more thunder, but just to show you the object lesson. Fire can make things moldable and shakeable when nothing else can make them that way. So, Pastor Bruce, um, would you come and pray for us this morning? Pray for men and women, husbands and wives. Pray for Jesus' church around the world, and especially right here. Thank you, brother. Sure. It's a hard act to follow. <laughs> you can do it too. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to be here. We always love coming to this church. Um, that's part of what makes our trips to St. Pete so special when we can come. So, really thankful to be here. But yeah, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your grace to us, your mercies that are new every morning. Lord, you are so good. Thank you for an opportunity to worship you, to reorient our hearts. Father, we are, we so easily stray from you, Lord. We are prone to wander. And thank you for helping to calibrate or recalibrate our hearts to turn them to you again, Lord. And, and forgive us, Father, because we do stray so easily. And thank you that you, you always take us back, Lord. You're always so good to us. Lord, help us to uh, seek you in new ways, even today, Lord. Help us to be awake to your purposes and to your word. And uh, Lord, help us to love your word, um, that it wouldn't just be uh, some kind of cultural practice that we've gotten used to, Lord, but we'd really hear your words afresh, Lord, animated by your spirit, and that it would transform us, Lord. Uh, thank you for all your blessings, Lord. Thank you for uh, the children in this church and uh, the joy of seeing them. They're so exuberant, and uh, they're just uh, so precious, Lord. Thank you for this building thank you for air conditioning mm -hmm. lord thank you uh for the beauty lord that we we thought about at the start of this service lord there's so many things that we we take for granted lord that you give us each day and just uh thank you for family and friends and thank you that we've come into the hearing of your word and that we have uh that we've learned of the truth and the goodness and the beauty of christ and the forgiveness, Lord, that we can know and enjoy not only in eternity, but here, here on earth. And Lord, I, I pray for each person here, and I don't know many here, and you know the needs of our hearts, Lord. You, you know our hopes and our dreams and our fears, mm -hmm. our, our, our besetting sins. You know our insecurities, Lord. You, you, you know all of it, Father. And uh, we just cast our cares on you this morning, Lord, and ask you to help us and to provoke us where we need it, to awaken us where we're sluggish, Lord, to comfort us where we're sad, Lord. Um, thank you for those visiting, Lord, for Steve and Kristen here today, and bless them as they seek to find a, a place here and get established here in, in Florida. And, Lord, for many others, Lord, uh, I think of the celebration tonight that's so meaningful, Lord, and uh, there's so many reasons to thank you, Lord, so just bless us as we continue to worship, bless uh, Pastor Tim, Lord, thank you that he traffics in your word so carefully, and 
that uh, we can be the beneficiaries, Lord, of going a little bit deeper and knowing and understanding you. So just enlighten our hearts, Lord, and warm our hearts, Lord, for so that we can live for you um, in new ways, Lord. Um, we want to live lives of ceaseless praise, Lord. So help us to that end, we pray. In, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Give a nice warm round of applause for the When I and my family moved here in 1990, I became aware of a village down in Bradenton. For those of you who don't know where Bradenton is, just about 30, 40 minutes from here, south on 275. And it was called a missionary. Bradenton Missionary Village. I'd never heard of it before, but it's a huge village of individual homes built by Tropicana for retired missionaries. And they can live there almost free, very, very cheaply, very reasonably. And then I discovered, uh, and there's a, a large multi-purpose building in the middle of all those homes. It's huge, and they serve meals there all through the day. It's a huge building where you can have services and all sorts of activities for the retirees. Well, then I discovered that a lot of my missionary aunts and uncles who had come back from the mission field, who I knew as my uncles and aunts, and that's sort of a missionary jargon, all the people on the mission field with you are your aunts and uncles, they had retired there. And that was a real surprise because I adored them. I loved them. I mean, they were my heroes. So I went down to visit. And because of that, because they knew what kind of work I was in, they would invite me down for various things. Wedding anniversaries, uh, birthday parties, and the inevitable funerals. I mean, that's what happens in a retirement place. And they asked me to take part, often. Sometimes it was simply to offer prayer, read the scripture, other times it was to actually speak. On one occasion, after going down there many, many, many times, a woman came up to me, a missionary retiree who I didn't know if she was from another field, somewhere around the world. She came up to me after I'd taken part in the service, and I don't know what I did. And she said, well, She said, I guess you're one of the ones that turned out all right. What she meant was, is that thousands of MKs who were born and raised on the mission field went to school down there at a boarding school, came home after high school to go to college. And a lot of them were not all right. And I know that to be true, because I have met many MKs in my generation who became disillusioned with Christianity in various ways. Some of it was due to their parents. Some of it was due to, as in my case, some severe occasions of abuse and mistreatment, almost torture sometimes, on the part of teachers and house parents, especially house parents. Other things, they come home to American Christianity, they see Americans pursuing the party lifestyle, turn them off. Materialism, the love of money and things, they just are overwhelmed by how greedy American Christians are, live for things. And it just turned them off, and they walked away from God. They walked away from Christianity. And as a result, a lot of missionary parents live with full-time grief and suffering. That's what she meant when she said, I guess you're one of the ones who turned out okay.
as I've thought about that conversation, and I've thought about it a lot, the parents were unprepared for their kids to rebel. They didn't have any idea that their own blood children would rebel. They weren't ready. And the kids were not ready and prepared to suffer. And suffering took them by surprise and just knocked them off their feet. We just last Sunday looked at how Jesus scolded two travelers on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, 13 and following. And he scolded them because despite the fact that their own Old Testament, their own Bible, is a record of messianic figures, one after the other, after the other, after the other, who all suffered and followed the pattern of Jesus and then was exalted. All those people prepared the Jewish people for Jesus who followed this exact same pattern. He was rejected, he suffered, but then he returned miraculously through resurrection. The pattern of leaders being made to suffer first is still going on. Please do not misunderstand me. I've watched your children. I love your children. I love the little kids in this church. And I can see, I can see that almost every one of them is going to be a leader boys and girls. And one day, God's going to call your child to suffer. And I want you to be prepared. And I want you to prepare them for the day that God puts them in a furnace and makes them suffer. Why? Because the only leaders that really make an eternal difference are leaders with scars who've been mistreated, abused, hurt, and wounded. They're the best leaders. Oh, the church in, this, in America has tons of leaders. They all wear medals, but very few of them have scars. Scars to prove those medals. And as I look at your kids, I think God has earmarked them for leadership. And if he has, he has earmarked them for suffering. And so what I want to do this morning and I must say this too. As I looked at this exposition and the takeaways, especially for parents and coaches and teachers and disciples, there's so many good takeaways here that I'm going to have to split the message into two weeks. So today and Lord willing, next Sunday. But what I want to show you is the story that's an interpretation of what happened in Genesis. It's an interpretation by the psalmist in Psalm 105. 16 to 22, he looks back at the story of Joseph, the second youngest of Jacob, and how God, early in life, marked him out for leadership. And because he marked him out for leadership, guess what? He sent him to a school mm -hmm. called Suffering. Because without the suffering, he would be unprepared to lead a nation successfully <coughs> through a crisis. One day, God's going to send your child into a family, a school, a church, where there's going to be a crisis. And he's going to tap your daughter and your son, and he's going to call them to lead that family, that marriage, that church, that business, that school, through a crisis successfully. And the way God does that, the way God prepares that child, is he takes that woman and that girl and that boy and that young man through a period of suffering. Hopefully, like Joseph, he will respond to it positively and not shake his fist at God and say, you hurt me, I'm done with you. Instead, he will have enough theology in his mind to realize that God does all things well, even sometimes when he brings pain into our lives. So, let's look at the text, 105 of Psalms. This might be just a little bit different from your English translation. Forgive me for that. But Psalm 105 is a history of Israel from 
Abraham only to Joshua. And at the beginning, the first five verses, he says, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his accomplishments among the nations. He goes on and says, sing to him, make music to him, tell about all his miraculous deeds, boast about his holy name, and let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord, the strength he gives. Seek his presence continually. Re Notice this, recall or remember the miraculous deeds he performed in your past history, his mighty acts and the judgments he decreed. O oh, children of Abraham, God's servant, you sons of Jacob, God's chosen ones. So for the rest of the psalm is a series of paragraphs that show God's mighty deeds. So he's going to give examples in the history of Israel of God's mighty deeds. And 16 through 22 is one example. So when we get done with this paragraph, we are called upon to give God glory and praise for that mighty deed. So let's have a look at it. First, verses 16 through 19. What we're going to see here is that God sent a young man, a teenage boy at age 17, named Joseph. He sent him to a school called the School of Suffering in order to forge his character, to forge his leadership character. So that one day, that young man, 13 years later, that's right, he went to school of suffering for 13 years. The reason he had to go so long is that I think he was spoiled. And it took about 13 years for him to get unspoiled through the fire of suffering. Because of the, then he could lead Egypt through famine, through crisis, and save his own famine from starvation. Let's read it. Verse 16, when God summoned a famine in all the land, that would be the land of Canaan and the land of Egypt, when God summoned or called a famine, that's a crisis. When you live in an agricultural society, a famine means there's no rain, and because there's no rain, the crops die. And if the crops die, there's no food. So when, when, and there's a lot of timing issues in this paragraph, when, when God summoned a famine in all the land and destroyed every source of food, verse 17, God did something else. God sent a man ahead of time, ahead of Jacob's family. He was sold as a slave. It was Joseph. Verse 18 is information that we do not have in the book of Genesis. This is new information about Joseph's imprisonment. As you know, he was falsely accused by a woman and put in prison for two years. We don't know how he was penned up, but the word there used in Genesis is of a dungeon. And notice verse 16 or 18. Joseph's feet were tortured in shackles. His neck was put into an iron collar. Verse 19. Here's the second instance of a timing issue. Until the time when his word was fulfilled, the Lord, different word for God there, Elohim he used in 16 and 17, the standard Middle Eastern word for God, Elohim, but he changes here in verse 19, until the time when his word was fulfilled, the Lord, Yahweh, refined, smelted, sarak, sarak is the Hebrew word, smelted, his character, smelted his heart. What does he mean when he says, until the time came when his word was fulfilled? We don't know. A couple of options here. Until the time when Joseph's interpretation of his own dreams, with his family falling down before him in obedience, or maybe when Pharaoh had a couple of dreams regarding a famine, until that famine came true, which would tie into verse 16, when God summoned a famine, until the time came when God's word, or Joseph's word, was fulfilled, what did the Lord do? What was he doing all along? When, when his feet were in shackles, and his neck was in an iron column, and he was sold as a slave by his own brothers, the Lord what? Tested and refined him. The Hebrew word here, refined, is the word used all through the Old Testament 
of refining silver. Silver is something you find in the ground, but it's in solid form. And to get it to be a liquid, a liquid silver, and to be able to remove all the slag and all the impurities in the silver, you have to put silver into a fire that reaches almost 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. You will never purify silver unless you stick it into a hot fire. So God the silversmith, God the silversmith, put Joseph, a teenage boy, at the age of 17, till the age of 30, same age as Jesus' adulthood, into the fire. Why? Because Joseph was spoiled. He was entitled. His father had spoiled him. His mother died early in life. Joseph had very little discipline in his life. He was arrogant. He was a tattletale. And God took 13 years for what? The impurities in his life to come to the surface. And that enabled what? The silversmith, God, to remove, to remove those impurities. You mean God sent Joseph into pain and suffering? Yep. If God has earmarked your children for leadership, guess where your boy and girl are going to go? They're going to go to school. And it's going to be a hot fire. Why? Because God hates them? No. He wants to use them to help a family through a crisis. Through a national crisis, a school crisis, a marriage crisis, a church crisis, a sibling crisis. You just can't take anybody to move people through a crisis. It takes a special leader to do that. Leaders who have what? Scars. But who have been purified through suffering. Today, it's interesting. If you want to be a leader, what do they do? They send you to a class or to read books about being a leader. I don't find any of that in the Bible. What I find is what? A leader, a true leader of God, someone who has turned around and looked at his back. He's, he's been stabbed in the back. He's been abused. She's been lied about. She's been mistreated. She has suffered and been wounded. She's been abandoned by her father, a product of divorce, whatever it is. And God takes those children and removes the impurities in that girl's heart, that man's heart. And then he's ready, then she's ready to be able to lead someone through the crisis. I look at your children. I see leaders. They are such leaders. And I'm hoping that today will be a new vision for you as parents to prepare them to take that fire of suffering as a way that God wants to shape them and use them. Look at what happened to Jesus. How did he become a leader? He went through what? The fire of suffering. How did Mordecai become such a leader to Esther? He went through the fire of the death plot. Same with Esther. Esther was an orphan in a foreign culture in Persia. God brought her through fire suffering so that she could become one. A queen. This is God's method of preparing leaders. Um, What's unusual about this story is that God could find nobody in Egypt to do the job. He had to go to Israel. He had to go to Canaan. He had to find a foreigner from another country to come in and go through suffering, rejection, abuse, false accusation, and prison. Parenting is not about today. Parenting is not about today. Parenting is about what? 
You are parenting today for the future. You are preparing them tomorrow for the challenges they're going to face. And there are certain things that we must do to prepare our kids, as well as to prepare our hearts when they suffer. You know why or how God prepared Joseph? Got him away from his dad. That's right. His dad spoiled him. And if Joseph had suffered in Canaan, guess what Jacob would have done? He'd have rescued him. He'd have rescued him and short circuited the process of preparing Joseph. <clears throat> Notice that until the time came when his word was fulfilled, the Lord tested his character. We find his character. All right. The second thing. When Joseph finished, this is 20 to 22, when Joseph finished the school of suffering, Pharaoh got to work and appointed him. Notice what he did. Notice the first paragraph is all about what God did. Second paragraph, everything what Pharaoh did, the king. Then the king, or Pharaoh, sent for Joseph. See verse 7? God sent a man ahead of time. Then Pharaoh sent for Joseph from the prison and set him free. And typical of Hebrew, in Hebrew poetry, everything is repeated again. For example, the ruler of many people released him. The king made Joseph master of his house, ruler over everything he owned. He could imprison the princess according to his will, and he taught wisdom to his advisors. Look at these things for a minute. Master of his house and ruler over everything he owned. What's that telling us about Joseph? As a result of being trained in the fire and of having all of those impurities in his life removed by a hot fire of tribulation and suffering, why would Pharaoh now put him over his house? Who's in his house? Who's in Pharaoh's house? His kids and his wife, right? And so Pharaoh looks at Joseph and says, I trust you with my wife. I trust you with my kids. You have enormous power, but my kids are safe around you. My wife's safe around you. And then it says he, he made him ruler over everything he owned. So what did Pharaoh own? <laughs> he owned the whole nation. He would be today like a billionaire billionaire. And yet... He gave that responsibility to Joseph. What does he trust about Joseph? That not one penny will be missing. Joseph was not greedy as a result of the fire. He was content with what he had. The lure of American materialism, climbing the corporate ladder, climbing the successful ladder, did not matter to Joseph because God had taken that away from him. The abuse of people with power, Joseph now could be trusted for everybody in the palace. Everybody was safe. Is everybody safe in our homes? Are all the children safe in our homes because of the leader that we are? It's interesting to look at the New Testament requirement for leaders in God's church. The elders, the overseers, the shepherds, oh, that, that group of people that God uh, takes care of. You know what? You can't love money. You can't be greedy. You can't be argumentative. If you're addicted to alcohol, you're out. If you're an angry person, resentful, fighting, angry all the time, you are disqualified. Why? Because those people create an atmosphere where you're not safe. Families are not safe when you have a leader who is addicted to stuff. The sheep are prone to be savage. This is why God qualifies his leaders, you got to do this. And then, when he gives you a leadership responsibility, everybody there is safe. Everybody is secure. Nobody wonders, man, are we going to have an explosion today in the house? Is somebody going to be gone and come back and angry and wasting our money and getting in debt? No, we have someone whose character has been what? Refined. That's what you want to do with your kids in training them is that one day they're going to be a leader and they'll be ready. <laughs> they'll be ready. I told you about my life. I, 
all the abuse that had happened. I, and what happened to my older brother, who's now in heaven. But our family suffered for 50 years, 50 years of bleeding. And I was angry at God. But, you know, I realized my anger early on, before I got married. And settled it and said, okay, God, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're doing with my family. But we are wounded. We are bleeding. You've almost destroyed us. But I accept it. And I'm going to trust that what you do is best. And man, our whole life turned around. I could approach marriage and parenting without anger. And then able to prepare a family for future leadership roles. That's what I want for you. That's what God wants. It's for your kids one day to be in leadership and to people to look at them and say, I can trust that man, that woman with money, with my kids. They're safe when they are with them. And when a crisis comes, they'll have the wisdom to take them through. This is almost a joke, but I was in high school and there was a girl in my youth group named Patty. I didn't like her. She was weird, but... <laughs> she had an older brother named Mike who I didn't know real well three or four years older and he had gone to college and then I heard through the grapevine I guess through her she was always pestering me um, that he was going to go into the ministry only weirdos go into the ministry <laughs> God has a sense of humor <laughs> that was my attitude back then. I had no idea that God would stick me where I'm at. I had no idea. I never dreamed of it. I mean, I thought it was for weirdos. I guess I'm a weirdo. <laughs> you know all that suffering? And being able to deal with it? You know what has happened in my life? God has brought literally hundreds and hundreds of people who have been in, what, crisis. And God has developed. In fact, I've been weeping most of the morning. <laughs> I look at someone who's fallen into sin. I don't judge now. I just have compassion and sorrow for them because I know they're having a hard time. I know what guilt is like. I know what it's like to be mistreated and abused. And so when God develops that in a leader's heart, there's hope for a crisis. There's hope for people in crisis. They see scars on my back. And I see scars in them forming. And it forges a bond. And it forges hope, too. So, I I'm getting off track here. I knew I would this morning. But there's some things that we could start off with takeaways. Um, I'm only going to do one. There's about four for parents. And those of you who are in positions of leadership coach, a school teacher, a mentor, a discipler. But there's some takeaways that I want to discuss. The first one is long, but it's the only one, and then I promise I will quit. Excuse me. If God has marked out my child, my daughter, or my son, to be a leader in some future time, then what can I do as a parent as a teacher, as a mentor, a coach, a discipler, how do I get that child, that student, that athlete to be able to suffer setbacks and disappointments in life and to be mistreated without walking away from God? How can I do that? How can a parent do that? What are some things that we can do as dads and moms every day? Here's what comes to my mind. First, normalize discipline. Normalize discipline in the child's life, which means this, from the beginning of the child's life, especially in the early days, establish the law of consequences in their life. There is a consequence for every word you speak and every action you take. Show in your child's life that that law works for them. Discipline should never be a surprise to a child. Discipline should be what they expect every time there is something done that's incorrect. No, I don't mean in anger. No. Not overreact. Not over-discipline. 
It should be age appropriate. But normalizing discipline in a life is going to prepare them for what? Life. That's the way life is everywhere. There are consequences to what you do and consequences to what you say. So, for example, if they get a detention at school, if they get punished at school for some act, don't intervene. Let them suffer the consequences. Support the principal, support the coach, support the teacher, or the teacher aide. Now, sometimes there's some injustice. I get that. I felt the same. I've been humiliated by teachers in class. Suffered shame and embarrassment. I get that. It's hard. But the child should know that if there's wrongdoing somewhere, that they, suffer, they should suffer the consequences. This prevents an entitlement. This prevents a child from thinking, I don't have to obey the rules. I'm above the law. I'm special. They have to obey the rules, but not me. You know what? No child should walk out of your home thinking, I'm more special than the next child. When you normalize discipline in your home, you prepare boys to become effective husbands and fathers and leaders, and you prepare girls to become effective leaders and wives and mothers. Uh, before I got married, I wrote to Warren Brisby, with whom I had a relationship. I said, what would you recommend? I'm just starting out getting married. What do I do? He says, well, leading a home is like leading a church. You need a balance of love and discipline. Love and discipline. And don't get off on one or don't get off on the other. Maintain the balance. So to answer the question, how do I prepare our kids, my students, my athletes to suffer pain and hardship and disappointments and stay balanced is normalized discipline. Secondly, normalize setbacks, disappointments, losses, and failures. Let your kids know that other families have suffered. Other kids have suffered. Other boys and girls have had bad things happen to them. They're not the only one who has suffered. We're not the only family that has suffered. God is not just picking on me and my family. Expect suffering, normalize suffering. And what happens to the child when he realizes that other people suffer too? That other people are mistreated too? And other people are harmed? What happens to your child? They begin to sympathize with other children who are suffering. They'll say, oh yeah, man, you're going through exactly what I went through. And extend a hand of mercy and a hand of kindness. Um, often children, if they see a sibling mistreated or their parents mistreated, it happens. There's people here who have seen their parents mistreated. It's easy for that child to take it onto himself and get angry at God, at the school, whatever. In those cases, the message needs to come home again and again. Mistreatment happens to everybody. Setbacks happen to everybody. Everybody gets mistreated. Everybody gets wrong. Everybody. It happens. It's life. And it prevents entitlement. I should throw this in here. It's not part of it. But you know, if you saw somebody hurt in your family and you loved that person and they were mistreated and you're still angry about it today, uh, realize that that anger is not going to help you going to help you. You can use that anger and energy to make things right, but not to get back at people. Not to hold a grudge and resentment against them. Learn to accept what God has sent you and use it to refine your soul. To take away greed, to take away laziness, procrastination, a love of money, and to deal with people who find themselves addicted to food, drugs, Alcohol. These are often things that happen in people's lives where there's anger and resentment because they are gateways to addiction. I've worked with addicts for 
30 years now. What's common among them is they resent God. They resent people. They resent their parents. They resent a teacher, a pastor, a principal, a headmaster. Resentment's a wide open door for addictions. Close the door. Forgive. Deal with it. Forgive. Let God take care of vengeance. And finally, in answer to the question, how do we prepare our children to suffer? How do we prepare our kids to suffer mistreatment because God has them on the road to leadership? The last thing is we normalize in our homes the emphasis placed on values and character. Values and character rather than achievements. Please don't be offended, but a straight A, straight A's on your report card is not an indication of character. It could be. If that person has worked hard, done his homework, her homework, followed the rules, didn't procrastinate, and they worked really hard and they got straight A's, that's great. But the value is what? On the endurance, the perseverance, the hard work, you know, the regularity of school. That's good. Those are values, but not achievements. Straight A's is an achievement. We focus on the values, the character of the heart. Here's an illustration, you've heard some of this before. All of you have probably heard of a school called Northside Christian School. There's a good chance you've heard that. Our oldest son, who's now a legislative attorney in Congress, was not a real big guy, but he had four special friends at Northside, one of them who's here this morning, played football. They were seniors, and they played the Crosstown Rivalry School. So, uh, back then it was a four-letter word called short rest. <laughs> Biggest game of the year. I was there. We were at home, and we lost the game. At the end of the game, I saw our oldest son and his three friends on the grass, weeping. But I had a backup plan which I had used all through their all through their athletic days. I'll begin by saying this. I never saw him lose a game in his life. Now the numbers on the scoreboard said that his team lost. But the way true wins occur, he never lost a game. Our culture believes that the most points on the school board meant, meant that you won the game. It's not true. You could be, could be 50 to nothing and you still won the game in the eyes of God. Why? I said to him after every game, whether he got beat or he won, you followed the leadership of your coach, you played for each other, you played for the team members, not for yourself, you played for those guys around you. You played to the best of your ability. You never took a playoff. And when you got tired, you kept going and you persevered. And you did not quit. And you didn't give in to the enemy of self-pity and anger and rage. You won the game. You won the game and I'm proud of you. You may have got your butt kicked points-wise, but you still won. You still won the game. Our culture screwed up in that area. We give the most money to the people who have the most wins. And the least amount of money sometimes to the people who are the best people on the field. And God has sorted it out at the end of the day. I'm, I almost want you to ask, I want you to almost turn off the tape here. But... I know who, what college this guy played for. And I don't know a lot about it. But a quarterback who played for a certain team in the Midwest who came to the Bucks and played quarterback eventually said that football is more important than his family. I have one four letter word to describe that person. And it's not a good word. 
It's not a good one. He might be your hero. Sorry about that. But he ain't mine. Put your family first. Put the interests of your children and your wife or husband above whatever it is that beckons you. It's called character. So next week, what I want to do is continue with the takeaways for parenting and leading, coaching, teaching, discipling from this passage. There's so much more. So I just wanted to do one to whet your appetite. I'll finish with this. I helped coach uh, Northside Soccer for a period of years. I was the keeper coach. And uh, there was one team we knew that we could not be numerically have more points on the board than they. They were state champs in soccer. And they were state champs pretty regularly. And our team, one year, we were Pretty weak. We had people who had never played soccer before in their life. <laughs> and I'll never forget it. One guy, now he had a Brazilian father and a Puerto Rican mother. He would think that he would be born good. <laughs> <laughs> I saw him on the sidelines. You know, you know what a throw it is on soccer? You're supposed to take the ball and do this. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that, right? <laughs> Even if you don't know anything about soccer, a throw is like this. I saw him take the ball, and to, to put it in bounds, he did a basketball pass. <laughs> I did not see that from a, from a Brazilian. <laughs> he did a basketball pass to one of his players. Well, anyways, we played this team. It's across the bay in a place called Tampa. And at halftime, at halftime, uh, I should say this, many of our players were sick and on the bench. Some of our starters, like I remember Kyle Steiner, he was uh, the huge shovel in the back of our team. And he, he was sick, a bunch of guys were on the bench sick. And we were down to, I think, 11 men. They had a huge squad, state champs, and at halftime the score was 10-0. And we were not ahead. <laughs> they called the game. Whew. I was hoping they called the game after five minutes. <laughs> At the end of the game, the two teams usually do this, right? You, you kind of form a line and you say, good game, good game, good game, good game. And they had showed us how to play soccer. They were good soccer players. And so to each player and to a group, I said, man, you guys did a great job. In fact, I said, you guys gave us a clinic on how to play soccer. Thank you. Not one person, not one person was gracious or humble and said to me, oh, thanks, you guys really tried hard. They were all arrogant. And I thought, we won the game. On the way home in the bus, our guys were not falling over themselves with tears, angry at themselves. In fact, I think they were a little too goofy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? If I was going to marry one of those boys, which team do you think I would choose to choose a husband or a wife? Wouldn't that team? Arrogant, proud, and not gracious and humble with your competitors? See, leadership is not about how many medals you have on your chest and how cool you are and how many followers you have. I won't take any of those leaders because none of them have scars. Give me a leader who has scars, who has suffered, mistreated, stabbed in the back, lied about, punched, wounded, and has emerged. Humble, gentle, loving, forgiving, and in touch with the God of heaven and earth. That's a leader I want in my home. That's a leader I want in my church. That's the kind of leader I want in a small group. People who have been hurt and beat up, and they've emerged humble. That's the kind of leader that Jesus was and Joseph, because he went into a school of suffering and said, yes, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do, even if it's pain. Thank you for listening. Let's stand.
Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for being willing to say goodbye and, in fact, send your son to a school of suffering, rejection by his own, stabbed in the back, lied about, false witnesses at his trial, a monkey trial, by crooks, thugs, and criminals in leadership. And he stayed the course and didn't run away. As the song said, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. There's leaders here. There's future leaders here. There's little boys and girls who one day are going to suffer. Not necessarily because of their wrongs, but because of somebody else. And these parents have the privilege, yes, and the challenge of preparing them for that day. So encourage every parent here that their job is huge. And what they do to their little girl and their little boy today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day is going to impact probably hundreds and thousands of people in the future. Because there's a crisis that's going to happen. And God's going to tap a daughter or a son and say, I need you to help this crisis be solved. So encourage the parents. Give them hope. Give them discipline and give them partnership together, to work together as team members to prepare their kids to lead. We ask this for the glory of God the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Normally it was, uh, and then we'll see at 5.30 if you can at our home. This is from 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 19. It's a short one. I'll begin. You're the congregation, in case you were wondering where you fit. I'll start loud and clear. You resound and we'll end our time together. As God's family called to suffer according to God's will, we confess ourselves to our faithful Savior and to continue to do good. Let us go forth with humble courage and renewed strength. Thanks be to God.